Our Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful this afternoon for this is another privilege to stand in the pulpit to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ to a dying world that's without God, without Christ, without hope, no hope of going with Jesus when he comes. And we're trying, Lord, to present Jesus Christ to the nations. While we're assembled here this afternoon, may the Holy Spirit speak and warm our hearts and encourage us in the way. May the sick be healed and the sinners be saved. Those who are discouraged be encouraged. May God receive all the glory and the honor. May it be given to his name, for that's our purpose. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. I am happy this afternoon to stand here again in, at Beaumont. And I'm usually tired. I've been going since Christmas straight. It isn't so much of the preaching that I do that makes me tired. It's the visions that make me tired. Our Lord, one, calls him to turn around and say it's strength that left him. One vision upon the prophet Daniel. He said he was troubled at his head for many days. And so we, we can't explain those things. We just know they're so. And no one knows any better than those that happen to. <laughs> and so we are happy. Oh, what I'm trying to do is use a prophetic gift for an evangelistic work. It just doesn't work that way, right? It's too hard. So, but I want to say this when I come to the end of the road. And when this city here rises up, at the, this generation in the last days, I, I don't want any man's blood upon me. I want to be free from all the blood. And I've tried my best to, to present it in a scriptural way, this ministry that the Lord has given me in every way that I know how. And, and I know the Holy Spirit, by His grace, lets me live so that I don't think there's been any marks. I'm grateful to Brother Perry Green. And to these brethren here that's put forth their efforts to make this a meeting a success. If there's anybody lost in this city, in this generation, it certainly won't be upon them, fellas. Because they have turned every stone to try to make it uh, a success. Feeding the people, getting them places to sleep, and, and on television, everywhere, just taking the money right out of their own pockets and placing it right out so that they know that... Uh, the, the, the crowds that we have wouldn't be able to support such as that. And so they took it out of their own pockets to do it. So I think that's wonderful. Like, uh, somebody with a vision like that, uh, I believe it was said over in Hebrews 11, chapter of whom the world is not worthy. And to stick their neck out in the time that when the, the ministry is so unpopular amongst too many of the people that should believe it. Those who it's been talked about, but when something happens and they fail to see it. But it's just got to be that way. You, you have to just straighten up your shoulders and walk on to know that, remember before you, it was the same thing. They marched right down the road the same way. The people has never known their hour of visitation. None of the prophets was ever known. Jesus said, you put them in the tombs, you garnish your tombs now, you're the ones that put them in there. Which one did God send that you didn't persecute and slay? Let's take it from then on out. Come down through Martin Luther and down through, well, Irenaeus and St. Martin and all down through the ages. It's been the same way. Even to Joanna, Joanna of Arc, a prophetess of the Lord. You Catholic people, when that woman would see visions and so forth and tell them they come to pass just as she said, what did you do? You burn her to the stake for a witch. About 200 years later, you woke up and found out what you had done. Of course, they'd done penance. They dug up the bodies of those priests that had her burned and throwed them in the river. That's a great penance to do. They failed. They said it's St. Patrick was a Roman Catholic. Anybody that knows history knows that's wrong. He absolutely firmly disagreed with the Pope. Never would go to city. He wouldn't believe it at all. Suscat was his name. It wasn't St. Patrick. But after he was dead and gone and you killed thousands of his children in his schools, 
He wouldn't permit a crucifix or nothing to be in his school. It still stands up in Northern Ireland today. The same thing. He, he wouldn't let that enter into his school. He said the people would be looking at images instead of what he wants them to see. He had the power of the Holy Ghost. He spoke with tongues. He had great miracles and signs. Why don't the church preach that today? And all those people, they never know them until they're gone, passed on. Then we try to build their tombs. It's truly that we're living in, the church is always living in a glare of a light of another day. And that uh, glare is a false light. What is a glare? It's like a mirage on the road. The sun shines down and makes a mirage. It looks like water, but it, you never can get to it. It's not there. That's the way the people does today. They're promising something that's going to be way off or something's way back there, way up here, but they never get to it. I'm so thankful that our God's not a God like that. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We get to it when we believe it. It's right there. Everything is promised for the age. Makes it hard. But yet, as we must go right on just the same believing. And I certainly appreciate your all's fine cooperation while you're in the city. I was here many years ago with my old friend, Brother Bosworth, and Raymond Ritchie, and many of the brethren come over here. I still believe the same gospel. I haven't changed one bit. It's still the same thing. But you see, the revival was going on then. And where there's no revival, you just can't get things done. The ministry is far more advanced. It was only telling you then this would come. How many remembers that? Sure you do. And it come just exactly like it said it would. Then I'd take the people and lay my hands up on them. I told you what he told me. And that's just the way it happened. It just exactly. It's never failed to be the truth each and every time. So it has to come from God. No one could doubt that. But you see, the revival's not on. Just your presence to walk in with the people while the people get up out of cots and stretchers and walk around. Just lay your hands on them and my, that just sent them whirling. I've seen lines where there'd be four and five hundred people come through the lines, deaf, dumb, blind, cross-eyed. Not one of them failed, but what was healed? Every one of them. Try it today. See? There's no fire. In Rome, when the, the fires went out in the temple at Vesta, the people went home. See? Now there's no revival fire to back it up. See, it's, that's just it. After a while, if the world stands, they'll start living in the glare again. See? That's the way it all is. done passed over and missed them, and that generation's to be judged for what passed over them. They failed to see it. Jesus Christ is alive this afternoon. He's walking around here with us now. He's ever present. Wherever two or three are assembled in my name, I am in their midst. Believe that, won't you? I hope if the Lord tarries, I get to come back and be with you sometime again. If I never see you again, when I meet you there at the judgment seat of Christ, where we'll all meet, remember, I've told you the truth. I'll still be saying that when I meet you there. Until then, may the Lord bless you richly. Pray for me. I need your prayers. I'm not as young as I was then. That's about 12, 14 years ago. And somebody asked me the other day, he said, how old are you, Brother Branham? I said, just past 25. <laughs> I said, 25 years ago, <laughs> I passed it. And I, you don't, you, you can tell it. A man only, when you are born, you start growing like a candle or a burn, you're lit. But you grow until you're about 22 to 23. I don't care how well you take of yourself, you start dying right there. And you keep getting lower and lower till it burns out. I asked an Aquinas one day when I was speaking, I said, I want somebody, a doctor told me, said, I can't not believe the story of Christ because I can't believe the virgin birth. He said, I don't believe there is such a thing. I said, the natural birth is more mysterious to me than the virgin birth. The natural birth to see how it happens. And how it's decided with us pollen, which egg, when there's thousands of germs and thousands of eggs, not the, the first two meets, that settles it. But maybe you say, well, the or two in front, oh no, so it'll stand. One maybe raise up the germ from the very back of the sperm on this side, in the middle of one of the egg, it decides where it's going to be, a girl or a boy, black-headed, red-headed, blue eyes, or whatever it's going to be, something makes that decision. The rest of them's done away with it's so mysterious to see the work of God and then to see people with a little finite mind like we are try to deny his great works. This fellow said to me, 
Well, he couldn't believe anything. It couldn't be scientifically proved. I said, do you believe you've got a soul? He said, sure. I said, then scientifically prove me you got one. I said, you, you believe it is such a thing as love? He said, sure. I said, you love your wife? Yeah, I said, then you show me scientifically what part of you is love. I want to buy some. I'll go to the drugstore where I just sell it. I need a whole lot of it. I like to buy some love. See, the, all the whole armor of God is supernatural. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience, and the Holy Ghost. See? Every armor of the believer is looking at the unseen, believing what is said. See, you don't see what you believe. See, you, don't, you don't see it anyhow. You look it with your eyes. You see with your heart. See? You just look at anything and say, I just don't see it. You mean you don't understand it. See? So... I asked him this, I said, if I had a jug of water, and I said a glass here, and I'm pouring water out of this jug into the glass, and it gets half full, and then I just keep pouring water, and then it starts going down. Scientifically, tell me where the water is going. Sure. Right. I said, when I was a little boy, 16 years old, I eat the same food I eat right now. Beans, bread, potatoes, meat. I said, every time I eat, what did it do? It built blood cells. I got bigger and stronger all the time. And when I got about 22, I eat more and better now than I did then. Because I didn't have it then to eat. But I eat more and better than I did now. I'm getting older and weaker. And yet, that food builds blood cells. I'm adding new life all the time and going down all the time. It's an appointment. We're going to keep it. That's with God. That's right. We're going to. You can't scientifically prove God. You just believe God. And you believe him according to his word. Right. Now this afternoon, I want to thank each and every one of you. The nice little sister there on the, um, on the piano. This one over here. And all you people, ministers, every one of you. Lord bless you. The night won't get too dark. The rain wouldn't fall too hard. But why, I'd help you if I could. I used to say I could come to you. But there's too many now. It's, I've been over the world. See, it's everywhere. But just give me a ring. Or write me a letter, send you a prayer cloth, anything I can do, everything absolutely free. There's no money in this, see, but I kept my meetings like this so I could come where they haven't got any money. I held a meeting here not long ago in a, a tabernacle that only held 20 people, a two nights meeting. It was awful, down about 10 below zero, but the Lord sent me there and great things happened. I don't have, to, I don't have no big programs, radio, television, all this other stuff. Other brothers have that. There's maybe intelligent, intellectual man. They know what to do, and the Lord's granting it. Like Oral Roberts and a man like that who have to have thousands of dollars a day. He can't operate no other way. And that's for a good cause. And that isn't mine. I wanted mine to stay little, humble, wherever I can go and wherever God calls me. I have nothing to hold me then. I just take off and go wherever it is. That's my ministry. Pray for me that the Lord will help me to keep the faith and... Not look back, look forward to where I'm going. Not look where I've been, look where I'm going. Forgetting those things that are in the past, we press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ. I want to read some out of God's Bible today. Chose just a little text because I told you I'd come down and pray for the sick this afternoon. All those holding prayer cards and those who want to be prayed for, will be, we'll do that. Now, I always try to keep my promise. Now, somebody, when they say that, say, well, you promised to be in a certain place. I wouldn't doubt, but what these four or five places in the United States right here I'm supposed to be today, where somebody said I'd be there, I never said I'd be there, but they say it, you see, put it in the paper, they call home all the time, well, what's the matter, say the wife or some of the office force, well, he is supposed to be here, they advertise him here, well, they advertise it's in the paper, I didn't even know nothing about it, I can't help that, I'm only responsible for what I say myself, so, now, this afternoon, I want us all, again, if we will, stand for the reading of the word. We're going to try to get out within about one more hour, the Lord willing. So you can be fresh to go to church tonight. The reason we have these meetings on Sunday afternoon, so we won't rob anybody from the churches, the people that wants to be prayed for here, the sick and the afflicted, while well, we always get to pray for them, then they don't interrupt your service. No matter as many times there's a man I don't dis I disagree with, they disagree with me. But if it can't be upon tolerance and upon the thoughts of better fellowship and things, then I, I won't say nothing about it. If I can disagree with the man ever so much, if I can't put my arm around him and from my heart know he's my brother, then I oughtn't to be talking to him. That's right. We've got to do that. 
Now, you want to turn in your Bibles, turn to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. I want to read from there this afternoon for the closing service. Take a text. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Let us bow our heads. Most gracious Lord, take these words and May the meditation of our heart now be acceptable unto thee. May the great Holy Spirit move into the lips of the speaker and the ears of the hearer, that together it might bring honor to thy name through thy word, for we ask it for the glory of God. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to watch now what, so we can have plenty of time for the prayer service. Now listen close as I try with these few scriptures and notes that I have wrote down here to speak it. Sometimes I'm not tired and wore out and never wear that, write down a scripture note I can remember. But lately it's just been so, I just, sometimes I, forget, I can't think of it. So I just jot it down here. Uh, a little something like a certain scripture. I know what that means and I just go from there on. I want to speak on the subject of influence. Now, you know, there's somebody that you're influencing. Your life is a written epistle read of all man. Therefore, if your life isn't according to your testimony, uh, or your testimony according to your life, rather, then there's, you're putting a stumbling block in somebody's way. Or somebody is watching you. Some little child is watching his mother, watching his dad. Here some years ago, I read a little article around Christmas that was, Sir, did warm my heart with grief. When a, a, a fellow had been out and was a good man, he didn't, he didn't drink really, but he, he'd been out around Christmas and visiting his colleagues and they all said to him, said, John, have a little, just a little drink. And from house to house, he, he got too much. And he had to go back home and crossing the park. He, his little boy was with him, and he, he missed the little boy and turned around and looked. And the little boy was just going from one side to another. And the dad waited till the little boy got to him. He said, why are you going all over the park, son? What makes you walk like that? He said, Daddy, I'm trying to walk in your footsteps. And that's right. The, little, the man picked up the little boy and sat down and tucked the little fellow in his arms. He said, God, you forgive me. I want to walk straight so my son behind me will walk straight. And that's what we want to do as Christians. We want to walk like Christians, live like Christians, talk like Christians. Many years ago, when they used to have slavery in the South, they, down Kentucky and Alabama and down where I come from, they used to take... The colored and auction them off at the, at the auction block, just like you'd have used cars or something. Uh, I believe no man's to be a slave. 
God made man and man made slaves. And they used to come by and buy them just like you would buy a used car, get a bill of sales and so forth. That was a terrible thing. So they, one day there was a buyer come by, to a broker, to a, an old plantation that had uh, many slaves. And he said, how many slaves you got? Oh, I said, around 150 out there, I guess. Said, Could I go out and look over them? He said, sure, help yourself. So he went out to look over the, the slaves. And when he looked around, he noticed them fellows uh, always. They were sad. They, the Boers brought them over from Africa and old loaded them in Cuba out there. And then sent them over here in the south and sold them for slaves. And they know they never go back home. They know that they never see their father and mother no more, their children, husband, wives, and so forth. They were, they were a victim of circumstance that they didn't make themselves. And here they was, away from home and sad, and sometimes they'd have to take whips and whip them, just like they do uh, beast, cattle, and ox, and horses, and things. And then they, um, they make them work. And this, uh, they notice, this young broker notices one of those young slaves, they didn't have to whip him. My had his chin up, his shoulders back, and he was really right on the mark all the time. They didn't have to be doing anything to him. He had the job done. So the owner of the slaves said, uh, the broker said to this uh, owner, said, I'd like to buy that slave. He said, oh, no, he's not for sale. He said, well, why ain't he for sale? Said, what, uh, you, said, what, are you, what makes him that way? He said, uh, is he the boss or the rest of them? He said, oh, no, he's a slave. Said, do you feed him different than you do the rest of them? He said, no, they all lay out in the galley together. Said, he's just a slave. He said, well, what makes him act different than the rest of them? Said, you know, I often wonder that too till I found out that over in the homeland in Africa where they come from, his father is the king of the tribe. And yet he's an alien far from home, but he knows he's a son of a king and he acts like it. Oh my. Amen. What are Christians to do? We're sons and daughters of the King. Though we are aliens, let's act like sons and daughters. Women, let your hair grow out. Quit wearing them clothes that you wear immoral and these man, get back to where a man ought to be. Don't act like sons and daughters of God. You're an alien here. But remember, we're sons of the King. See, that influence that man had upon the rest of them. His morale kept the rest of them's hopes high. We find out that this uh, King Uzziah was a shepherd boy in the days of Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. Prophets are born. They just not laying their hands on them and making them prophets. They're born, foreordained of God. Gifts and callings are without repentance. There's a a gift of prophecy in the church, and it must be judged by three people before the voice should ever be heard amongst the congregation. But um, that's just a gift of prophecy. But a prophet is absolutely ordained with thus saith the Lord from childhood up. And Isaiah was a prophet of the Lord. And he had uh, been taken to the temple. And he had, uh, this uh, Uzziah, this young shepherd boy, was a, a great influence upon this young prophet. Because Uzziah in Second Chronicles 26 tells us that he became king of Israel when he was just 16 years old. His father Hazah died and he took his place to rule as it was a custom that the, the son um, uh, succeeded the, the king. And they took and made him king when he was just 16 years old. And had his father Uzziah, Uzziah was, was a great man. Uh, He was a a godly man. And having this godly parent, uh, it made him do the thing that was right because he was influenced by his father. See, today, how can you expect that we ain't going to have more Oswalds and Jack Rubies? Look at, I left my motel a while ago in such a drunken mess of a bunch of Californians out there laying out there women stripped naked out on that... Uh, and there was just a little bit of strap around them or something other out there and man drinking whiskey on, on ice and stuff and carrying on falling around the pools. How can you expect their children, young ones there in the yard playing around, be anything but an Oswald or something like yeah. that? It's the influence that's put before them. Oh, America's rotten to the core. She's going to reap what she sowed. 
A just God cannot let her get by with anything else. You say, are you? I certainly am American. On the fields in Germany and Japan, is American graves marked all, all through there. My people, Branham's. And if I had to go, I'd give my life for it. But let me tell you something. We need a stirring, this nation does. The things that we once had, we've lost. And we're trying to live up on a reputation of what somebody else done. We'll reap for it. God made Israel a people after his own heart. He made them reap, and we'll reap too for what we're doing. We have nothing else in front of us but reaping. We've crossed the line of grace and mercy. And nothing else left but a reaping. Mark that in your Bibles. I'm an old man. But you mark that down and find out whether that isn't true or not. Maybe when I'm gone and on and on, you'll find out that those words are true. We're going to get it. We're weighed in the balance and found wanting. And there's no way out. Right. That's right. We've done cross that line. You've got to reap what you sow every time. So this uh, young fella was such an influence upon this. Uh, the young king was an influence on on uh, the young prophet and uh, he leaned upon the arm of this prophet because it, he uh, he knew he was a prophet and he had him right with him all the time and uh, to draw his influence from his visions and so forth from God to know how to conduct his kingdom and it made him a great man he ignored the politics of that day and the popular opinions and served God with a true heart that's the kind of a president we need. That's the kind of a, a leader we need over the people of any nation, anywhere. His kingdom was next to Solomon's. There was nothing. God just blessed him and helped back no blessing because he served him. And this was a great help to young Isaiah because that he seen how God would bless them that was true to his word. No matter how difficult it was, stay true to that word. And it's an example today also to us to stay true to the word. And it had a great influence upon him. Now, he planted vineyards and he was a herdsman. And he had all kinds of herds and vineyards. If you want to read in uh, Second Chronicles 26 there in different places of the scripture that speaks of uh, Uzziah. He was a great man. He, he loved the outdoors and such a fine fellow. God blessed everything he done. It just prospered and went right on. And no nations bothered him. They was afraid of him. And be because he served the Lord God that was with him. Not because he's afraid of his military force, but he's afraid of the God that he served. That ought to be our memorial. Our God, we trust, it says on our dollars. But I wonder sometimes. Now, but this all happened. And it shows here an example I'd like to draw from this this afternoon to show that how God can bless a man and, and make him a great man. But, you know, when this king got uh, uh, felt secure, felt to a place that it, he was just absolutely anchored and there's no way for him to ever fall, got lifted up in pride. That's when he took his tumble. That's when any man will take his tumble. I think that's what's the matter with a lot of our peoples today. We get lifted up. I think that's what causes organizations to do what they do. They get a better class of what they call a more intellectual, better class of people, they think. Man, they're, they're all their ministers of high school and college education, two or three years of psychology, give them mental tests and brain waves and everything to see if they fit the case and sometimes know no more about God than a rabbit does about snowshoes. That's right. Yeah. Right. That mental has nothing to do with it. It's a power of the Holy Ghost. It's not in your mind. It's in your heart. Right. But uh, see, we get then to get lifted up. Our, we go to the best church in town. We belong to the first church. We belong to where the mayor goes. We belong to this and all these things there. See what it is? Then the people just simply can't stand to hear that. They just think that you're just, just a terrible person. But what it is, there's no place for the seed to anchor. There's nothing for it to lay on. It's rock. It'll never take hold. The birds fly around, pick it up, the Bible said. But when this king got lifted up and felt secure, he got lifted up in pride. I notice a lot of times we find even people, evangelists, get to a spot where many of them has been accused of things and maybe some of it is true, of drinking and so forth. What it is, I think they build a little kingdom around them and think them people love them so well. There's no way at all for that. Them people, they can just do anything they want to, and those people overlook it. The people might, but what about God? 
That's where we fail to see it's God is the one doing the looking. God knows it. When you see truth and light and reject it, God knows what you've done. You'll never go no further until you come right back to that spot again. Amen. You can't cross over that. You've got to come right back to where you left off. He got so lifted up into his mind and, and got so self-secured and everything, so much that he tried to take a minister's place. He tried to go in and offer incense, as we know in the Bible, to burn incense, which was only for a Levite to do it, a priest that was anointed for that job. He tried to take his place. And here we have an influence of this king to let people know that this carnal impersonation of each other today, it's not of the Lord. Right. You're not ordained to such things. You'll never take another man's place and another man can't take your Amen. place. Find where your place is and abide there. Right. See, he thought, well, I, I, bless God, I'm a king and the Lord has been good to me. I can do this. I've got this. This is my ministry. To come to find out that in his uh, going on like that and tried to go over, step over what God was blessing him at. If you're a good lay member, be a good lay member. Yeah. If you're a good housewife, if God's blessed you as a housewife and made you loyal and true, sister, you just go, go continue to be that. Don't get thinking you God called you to be a preacher or, or deacon or something else. And, and you do the same, man. Wherever God has blessed you there, abide. Because that's where he's set you at. You do just what he tells you to do and see where he blesses you. But don't ever try to step in. That's a, that's a grassroots of Pentecost. When Mrs. McPherson, as I was reading her book, I didn't, I wasn't a minister in her days. And they said when she'd walk out on the platform of these like wings, you know, or, you know, kind of a robe like that. Every lady preacher wore the same thing. Every one of them carried a Bible the same way Mrs. McPherson. Did you ever listen to these radio programs? Every fella, Lord bless you, real good fella, a Billy Graham. It's carnal impersonations. I was reading the, uh, the history of Martin Luther, and the history said it wasn't so much of a mystery that Martin Luther could protest the Catholic Church and get by with it, but to hold his head above all the fanaticism that followed his revival. Yeah. That's right. Hold yourself clean and clear to your calling. Stay with God's Word and don't move for nothing. Stay abide in your calling. If he give you a job out there as a farmer, farm good. God bless you at it and pay your tithes and whatever it is your offerings to help the ministry go on. If he made a mechanic out of you and bless you in that work, stay with it and thank him for it. Yeah. You just abide where God calls you. We find here an influence. And then when he was trying to be corrected, the minister run after him and said, Say, wait a minute, you wasn't called for that. Oh, did he get angry? Why, he was ready to have his head cut off. See, there's another thing we have to know. No matter how much God's blessed you, you haven't got no right to rebuke the anointed of the Lord or say anything against them. Amen. That's right. God is the one to take care of that. They need any rebuke, and that's his children. You let them alone. You're not supposed to do that. See, and when you, you tell people of their sins and tell them they're doing wrong, come out. Don't just try to get to heaven on an organizational system or something. My goodness, they, they, they want to blow up, they, they want to find fault with you, they won't, they won't even sit and listen at you. Get up and go out and ill-mannered and just act anyway. You see, that goes to show the first place poor raising, home manners, certainly does. But we find out that this guy taking this attitude and doing the thing he did, what happened to him? The Lord struck him with leprosy right there in the building. And what's leprosy the type of sin? Unbelief. There's no other sin but unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Amen. And sin is the only unbelief there is. I was preaching one time in a Methodist church and I said, Smoking cigarettes is not a sin. Committing adultery is not a sin. Taking the Lord's name is not sin. Too much for one sister. She raised up and said, Pray tell me, Reverend Branham, what is sin? I said, Unbelief. You do those things because you do not believe. Exactly. The reason you refuse to walk in the light of the word is because you disbelieve the word. That makes you an unbeliever. The fellow said to me, he said, I wouldn't care how many cases you could show and how many cases the doctor could show of different healings. That I do not believe in healing. It's not so. I said, certainly it wasn't sent to unbelievers. It was only sent to those who believe. It's only for believers. He said, he that believeth, all things are possible. Not him that unbeliever. One speck of unbelief against the word of God and you'll stay out of the kingdom of heaven. 
It took Eve out. It caused all this trouble. Once, just to pervert the word, just a little bit, you've got to stay straight with it, what it says. How we find out this man got all haughty and puffed up and his face got red. And he turned around and tell them priests, and the first thing you know, he broke out with leprosy. Right there in his rage, he was smitten. He never did get over it. What? Disbelieving the word of God that was trying to be told to him. As a real example in that, notice, he was he disbelieved and in his anger, he was smitten with leprous in, died out in his own home, was never permitted to the kingdom anymore, the king's place. His son had to take his place and, and uh, help the best they could, and he was left like that until he died. Now, you see, he never did recover. Jesus said one word against it will never be forgiven. The word. Amen. Neither in this world are the world that is to come. It's unpardonable. So you see why the world is ready for judgment? The great evangelists and things that's covered the earth with the gospel, been laughed at, made fun of, everything else, there's nothing left. There's no way for it to ever come back. They've blasphemed the Holy Ghost and made fun of it and everything else. And they... And there's no way for it to ever come back. It's got to be paid for. There's no way out of it. God's just. It would be against his justice. Be against his, his, his being, what he is. And now, it's got to be paid for. So this king, no matter how much God loved him, what a great man he was, how much degrees he had, yet he done wrong and he had to reap what he sowed. Amen. And every man will have to do it. Then was a lesson... To the young prophet, then was a real lesson. By this Isaiah learned that God orders his man to his place himself. Not what somebody else orders. God orders his man to the job. Now, orders him to his place. He was not trying to take another's place. The vision, the thing was so great until it drove this prophet to the temple to pray. I wonder today if we would see the death of the churches, to see the, the dying out of the people from the Spirit, going on back and serving their creeds, if it ought to drive believers to their knees. It made a real believer, ordained believer, Isaiah the prophet, go to his knees. He went to the temple, and there he began to pray. And in the temple... He saw God on his throne, lifted way up high. God was going to show him what to look at, not look at one another, look up there to what he is. What he lifted up high on his throne. Note the heavenly seraphims with coverings over their faces. Now the seraphims is the burners of the sacrifice, which is one of the highest orders of angels. They're next to the cherubims. There was angels and then seraphims and then cherubims. And seraphims is actually the burner of the sacrifice making the way for the sinner's approach. A real high order of holiness in the temple of God. And he saw when he was down on the floor at the altar praying, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among unclean people. And he was making this confession and when he did, he looked up and he saw these seraphims they had two wings over their faces and two wings over their feet and were flying with two wings, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 all of God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's look at the vision the prophet saw and break it down. Two wings covered their faces. Think of it. Even Holy angels had to hide their sinless faces to stand in the presence of God. Was given wings to hide their face in the presence of a holy God. How are you and I going to stand there? If the seraphims had to use wings, God's provided way to hide their face to stand in His presence to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Reverence in his presence. Now we don't have any reverence to God. Everybody just thinks he's so secure till they, they, they don't they don't reverent God like they should. Why? Why do they do this? Because they're not conscious of his presence. 
That's the reason people do that. They, they don't recognize it. They can't, they can't comprehend that they're in the presence of God. Their minds become so perverted and taken up in the things of the world that they don't even pay any attention to it. They go to church, sure, but to realize that you're in the presence of God. Not only in a church, wherever you are, you're in the presence of God. If they could do as David said, I put the Lord always before my face, therefore I shall not be moved. As long as the Lord was before him, he could not be moved. And these heavenly sacrifice burners with wings over their faces and crying, holy, 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 to stand in the presence of God. What will happen to a sinful people that won't reverence God? You say, well, Brother Branham, you just said they were provided with two wings and you're provided with something too. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's your covering. Yet you don't stand as a seraphim. You don't stand as a cherubim. You don't stand as an angel, but you stand as a redeemed son or daughter of God Amen. by this blood. You don't have to have these wings that they had. They're a special covering for them in that presence. But you've got the blood of Jesus Christ for a covering to stand there. Now, how? Now, you, if you got that blood, then you honor God, you love God, you respect God, and God is the Word. Now, notice, secondly, with two wings, they covered their feet. What did that mean? Humility before God in His presence. Like Moses at the burning bush took off his shoes when he heard Him say, I am that I am. Paul, on his road down to Damascus, he, he fell on his face. John, when he saw the, the uh, Spirit of God above Jesus, he said, uh, I have need to be baptized of thee. And why comest thou to me? Here's a good example. Always be conscious of your littleness, not your bigness. Today, we, we Americans so much that we try to think that we're big somebody. We belong to something big, some big organization, some great big something. But all great big, big, big is all we see. And that when one time in the Bible, we have an example that there was a, a prophet went back in the cave and Elijah and God was trying to attract his attention to come out. And there come the fire and smoke and, and blusterous winds across the mountains and thunder and earthquakes and shakings and everything else. The prophet never even moved. God wasn't even in it. But when that still small voice spoke, he covered his face and come forward. When the still small voice of God's word speaks, not our racket, not our big denominations, not our big something, but that still small voice of the word that's looked over, that should call a man to repentance. God in his word. Yeah, he covered his feet and become conscious of his, our littleness before God. Thirdly, he could fly by the other two. Now remember, two, he covered his face in the presence of God. And to be reverent. Secondly, the two wings over his feet meant humility before God. And third set of wings now, he put himself into action. He could fly with them two wings, see? Two over his face, two over his feet, and flying with two. Now, what was it? Reverence, humility, and in action. God showed the prophet how his prepared servant must be. Reverent, humble, and in action. Amen. Now he's seen something different from Uzziah produced. He was showing the prophet what he must be, not like Uzziah, but to be like these heavenly cherubims. And if you want to look at a king, an earthly king, Look at a heavenly one, exalted above all the heavens. His train filled the heavens. There we see that uh, he has given him something to look at, to influence him different from what he had been looking at, thinking a man that served God and prospered and everything was fine. But Isaiah got his, his mind up on a man. And a man is a failure to begin with. I don't care who he is. Amen. He's born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. So he's a total failure. I don't care if he's a bishop, pope, presbyter, or whatever more he might be. He's a failure to begin with and don't never look to one. I don't care though he moves mountains with faith and though he uh, gives all his goods to feed the poor. Still, look at Jesus Christ. He's the one. Look at him, not at some man. Find out. 
It is showing here what a servant of God must be. How I must be humble and reverent and in action. Well, go into action. Many of us can be humble. Many of us can be reverent. But it's hard to get them in action. And then we notice that God was showing how he was preparing his servant. What he must be. Those cherubims were, or, or seraphims was God's servants. Notice, like the woman at the well. When she was looking for a scripture to be fulfilled that we spoke on two or three times this week. When she was looking for that to be fulfilled, the, the girl, as far as we know, didn't go to church. She probably, they're so far away from the word and things like that. To, and calling uh, the creeds and things that Jesus said, you've tucked your traditions and made the, the word of God of no effect. It's about the same thing today. The creeds that were taught and things just put the word of God out of action. The word can't come forth. And the things said true, they're so indocumented with something else, they can't see it. Remember that voice of hunt? Not only you hear, this tape goes all over the world. I'm not exactly speaking to you all here, but if somebody here needs it, well, that, it's for you then. But remember, that, that voice will haunt you as long as you live. In the day of your dying, it'll haunt you. Obey it. Come back. Our traditions has tucked the word of God and made it of no effect. The word of God being made manifest, and the people standing around said, Well, I guess that's pretty good. My, oh, my. It ought to set your soul on fire. Amen. It ought to do something, but it doesn't. Hallelujah. It doesn't do it. Fine. God, when this woman, them priests and things, probably she didn't go to church because she'd see no reason to go of something like that, but she had read the scriptures. For notice, she knew quickly when he's told her what her trouble was, why she said, uh, why we know that you must be a prophet. We haven't had one for the hundreds of years. But you must be a prophet, we know. Now see, my opinion, she thought, if you'll take that Marjorie reading there and read it in your scripture, it goes back to the prophet, which was Christ. Said, we know, we, you must be a prophet. We know that Messiah, when he comes, this will be the thing that he'll do. He'll be identified by this. And Jesus said, I am he that speaks to you. She went into action. She couldn't stand it no longer. The very thing that they were looking for was on earth right then. And she saw it. Amen. No matter how much she was in a bad shape, a prostitute or a woman like that could not, the man on the street wouldn't even listen to her. They wouldn't today. But stop her. How could you do it? It's like a house on fire and a high wind. You couldn't put it out. A fire got burning in her heart. She said, come see a man who told me the things I've done. This and this is the very Messiah. And it stopped too. When Jesus didn't have to do that one more time. The people believed her because, believed Jesus because of her testimony. See, what did it do? She was humble, reverent, and in action. She went to action when she seen the thing happen. The signs ought to influence today. The promised signs of the day. The promised word that's laid out for this day. To see God fulfilling what he said he would do. It ought to do something to us. But it doesn't. Just like it did to the Jews. They were so religious that they, they didn't think they needed it. They, they thought they had everything. And that's the way with the world today. It's got plenty to eat, plenty to wear, fine churches, big places, fine educated ministers and so on. They don't need nothing else. But you don't know. The scripture said you're a naked, miserable, blind. You don't know it. Don't know it and you can't tell them no different. They continually wait right on down that line and fail to let the word of God influence them to believe Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and alive today, the same yesterday, today, forever, Hallelujah. showing himself alive. They just simply dead. Everywhere, everywhere you go, seems to be the same thing. It had to be that way, oh no. He has to be put out of the church. There's no way at all for it to keep from being this way. God said it would be this way. But it, it, let it shake you. Let it shake you good, no matter what nation you're in, wherever you're at, whoever you are. Let it wake you up. Right. Hours come and go. The first thing you know, you'll be saying, well, I, I thought this was supposed to be this happened before the rapture. It might be a voice come back like it did one time. It's already happened and you didn't know it. 
You'll be all anchored off in a church somewhere. Say, I'm just as secure as I can believe. And the first thing you know, the rapture will be gone. It's going to be a secret, sudden going. Nobody know nothing about it. The world will keep right on going like Noah went at the ark. You remember after Noah went at the ark, he sat there seven days after God closed the door. God closed the door and Noah sat in the ark for seven days before anything happened. And the door of mercy will be closed in your face. And might already be. And just think of it. The people go ahead preaching. People think they're getting saved. Putting their names on books. Joining church. Shouting. Jumping up and down. Well, I see Mohammed shout. I've heard people drink blood out of a human skull and speak in tongues and do all those things. That ain't no sign you're saved. Oh, no. Having the form of God. What is the power thereof? They're speaking of. See, those things could happen. And it'll be a pastime and you won't know it. You can't afford to take that kind of a chance. Don't do it, friends. Come in while you can. Don't be influenced by some great big Billy, some great big uh, organization, some great high-polished scholar. Let the Word of God influence you. That's exactly what caused those apostles when they seen that Word made manifest. That influenced them. We are sure. Might stand quoting again. Jesus with great crowds of thousands of following him. He said, that's too many. Look, look something strange here. There's fewer called. Yeah, many are called, fewer are chosen. So then he's seen the great congregations. He said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. He never explained it. Now what if he'd say that in Beaumont today? No matter how popular he was, what do you think doctors and fine cultured people and scientists would say? That man's a vampire. Why well, he wants you to drink his blood? Or what kind of a, you're going off on a tantrum? Jesus never explained it. He wanted to shake them parasites off of him. Right. Then they all got up and left. Then he looked around to those apostles which was not ordained to life, but he had chosen them. It wasn't ordained. He said, what will you say when you see the Son of Man ascending up into heaven from whence he come? Oh, that was a choker. What did he... Them... That minister said, ascend up in heaven. Well, this man was born right here in Galilee. He was born to Nazareth. We know his mother, his, his brothers. We know the cradle he was rocked in. We see his baby clothes. We speak to his mother and then say, this man, come, go back up where he come from. He come from Nazareth. What does he say? Heaven. He never explained it. Too many parasites yet. They got up. They walked with him no more. That's what the Bible said. And he turned around and said, ah, you all want to go to, to the twelve? Remember, they couldn't explain it, but they know it. They know what he was. So they said to him, he'd influence them by his vindicated signs from God. What? He said, do you want to go all to the twelve? Peter said, Lord, who would we go to? For we are sure. Now, look, look study that. What is it? We know what the word says for today. We know what the Messiah is supposed to do if he comes today. We have seen this thing being met of God. He said it later on at Pentecost. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. By the things that he's supposed to do. And you've taken uh, Prince of Life and crucified him and God raised him up, which are witnesses of it. No, sure. See, he said, where would we go? Jesus said, I chose 12 of you. And one of you is the devil. And there's only 11 standing there out of it. Thousands times thousands. Eleven standing there. Oh my, influenced. Sure, this little woman, when she was influenced, she went into action. She had to do something about it. She had to tell somebody else and every real true soul that strikes Christ. You've got to tell somebody about it. Peter, when he took him at his word that night on the sea, saw him out there, had been, or that day it was, they'd been fishing all night and they hadn't caught nothing. Same back and forth. That's a discouraged time of anybody's a fisherman. Same all night. And he was a fisherman too. His father was a fisherman. He'd been on that lake all of his life. But his parents and his grandparents come from that lake. And he knew when the moon was right and which way the wind was blowing, all the signs. And he fished for a living. So he fished all night. And had taken nothing. Then they found out the next day that, that uh, they said this prophet was going to speak down on a bank. And I imagine how the little huts come, the little women and so forth coming down to hear him. The crowds got so great around the bank, he had to borrow this boat and Peter's boat to come out and wash your nets, not even one fish, and throw them up on there. It's discouraged. And sometimes at that discouraging moment, if you watch, that's when he comes around. But don't be blind enough to miss it. 
When you see everything happening the way it is in the world today, don't be afraid. See, don't be afraid. Just, just remember, he promised to come to you. And I'll notice, when he come, he told Peter, said, now launch out into the deep and let down for the drop. Peter said, perhaps I've never seen this done before. I, I don't know. I fished all my life here. The, the signs we just got through fishing all night through that same water. And yet, but there is nothing. We have a tuck of thing. But at thy word, Lord, yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. let down the net. Your word. You might have went through every hospital. Brother King, they might be saying that you're going to die. They might be saying, sister, this, that, or the other. I don't care what they said. Hey. At thy word, Lord, I'll let down the net. Right. When he's seen that word vindicated, when Jesus told him something, he believed it. And he let down that net into the water where there was no fish. But if God said so, he can put fish there. He says, but water in the skies. He can put healing in your body. I don't care if there's nothing there. You're trusting to raise it up in the last days. At thy word, Lord, I'll let down the net. It so includes that fisherman till he left the fish and all and followed Jesus. There was an influence when he took him at his word. Then what did he do? Well, he said, thank you, Lord, for a nice mess of fish. He said, leave your net alone. From henceforth, you'll catch man. The apostle went into action. <laughs> Find him at the end of the road. When they were going to crucify him, kill him, and he ran out of the city. And on the road out, as the history tells us, he was running for his life, getting out of the city. And he met Jesus coming back. He said, word for South Simon. Or Simon said to him, where goest thou, Lord? He said, I'm going back in the city to be crucified again. Simon turned and went back. And when they got him, he said, don't. They put him on a cross. said, don't hang me like that. Put my head down, my feet up. He'd been influenced when he seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. Yeah. Influenced for his death. He's influenced for anything. He went into action. Death couldn't even stop it. The crucifixion couldn't stop it. He was influenced. By Jesus. The blind man healed. They told him, hold his peace. But he scattered his fame everywhere. His people said, now, the priest said, now, if anybody goes to the tents at revival, they'll just come get their church papers, that's all. And the father and mother were scared of that. See, so they said, they come and said, how'd this boy get his sight? Said, he's, he's of age, asked him. They were afraid. But he that had been healed was influenced. Hey, man. Said this man's a sinner. Give praise to God. We don't know where this man comes from. He has no he has no credentials. We're not cooperating with him. We have nothing to do with him. We don't know where he comes from. We know he's a sinner and, and from the devil. This man had a good answer for him. He said, Now this is really a strange thing. He said, Now you're supposed to be the leaders of the land. And that man give me my sight, and yet you don't know where he comes from. He said, now, where is the sinner? And I, I can't tell you that, but this one thing I do know. Yeah. Where ain't I was once blind, I can now see. He'd been influenced. He didn't care to stand before a priest or anything. He had been influenced. His parents, even the miracle on their own son didn't influence him, but it influenced him. The people at Pentecost, as I said last night with their eternal life policy, when they went up to draw the, the dividends on them, notice when they were influenced, they had been holy, been reverent before God. They had covered their faces from the things of the world and their feet in humility. And when they felt the power of God come as was promised for Joel, as was promised for the prophets, as was promised for Jesus, wait up there at the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. As soon as that God, in the person of the Holy Ghost, came down upon them. They were influenced. They didn't care how many people laughed at them. Out into the street, they went standing like drunk, man. They were influenced by the Holy Ghost. You can be influenced, too. He stood right watching. He didn't go around and say some kind of a creed. He went right straight back to the Word. He said, you men of Jerusalem, you that dwell in Judea, let this be known to you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since the third hour of the day. But this is that... That was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. They were influenced by the word to the word. 
It ought to do us the same way. They got in actions. Yes, when his promise is fulfilled. When they seen that Jesus promised them that he would send the promise of the Father upon them. Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye. Tarry don't mean pray. It just means wait. Tarry means wait. Wait up there at the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And when this influence of the Holy Ghost struck them, it filled them. They seen the word that Jesus promised fulfilled. Now, I wonder if it would take the same influence on us this afternoon. If we seen what he promised to do in the last days fulfilled, what kind of an influence would it give us? What? All we have seen done in these last days ought to put us in action. It sure ought to. With reverence and humility. Beyond any shadow of doubt. The claim that was made 30 years ago about a pillar of fire that the cameras caught. Your Texas camera caught it not long ago. Scientific research thrown through all kinds of research that they could find by the FBI and everything. College, you do it. Tucking Texas for Texan. When you see the sign, it cannot be disproved. It's the truth. But will you believe the voice that follows the sign? The sign is scientifically proved. Now, someday when Jesus returns and catches the people all the way they are, it'll be made known too. Notice, the pillar of fire should put us in action as the pillar of fire vindicates its promise of the last days. Jesus said, I come from God and I go to God. And what he would do in the last days, and here he is both scientific and spiritually. In the word, proven it. it he come from God and still remains the same. He's still God. For the promise in the last days, it should put us in actions. Signs of the coming is at hand. Jesus said, as it was at Sodom, just before the world was burnt, the Gentile world, this would return. It should influence us and put us in action too. When we see the word fulfilled that he promised, it should put us in action. We, like the prophet, have seen the outcome of self-exalted denominations lose their place. I want that to soak real deep because I may never talk to you again. But men and women, may I say this, speak to you freely this afternoon in the name of Jesus Christ. Men who are sensible thinkers, men who are not so stuffed shirt, so far away from God by traditions, that they have seen the Pentecostal church. You've seen the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. You've seen the Catholic church lose its position in God. Lose their hold on the word when they accepted creeds. Uh, I was interviewed by a priest not long ago and he said to me, he said, well, I, he asked me about a certain thing and these things. He said, well, the Catholic church used to do that. I said, when? The Catholic church wasn't organized for 300 years after the death of the last apostle. He said, uh, he said, you're trying to try your case by Bible. I said, that's the word. He said, God's in his church. I said, God's in his word. Everything else be a lie in his truth. And he said, well, that's just a book at, at the early Catholics wrote. I said, then I'm an early Catholic. I believe just what it said. I'm a... I said, then he said, well, I see we're a greater church now. I said, then where have you lost? What's happened? If the early church cast out devils and proved Jesus alive upon the earth by spiritual signs and wonders, and here you've got thousands of intercessors of all kinds of dead women and dead men and everything, making intercessors in the Bible, the first pope said that there is no other mediator between God and man but the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Losing your hold on the word and accepting creeds and self-exaltation by man's exaltation. We've seen them lose their hold with the great Holy Spirit. We've seen the Pentecostals do the same thing. And you see it. When they organize, they die. There's no way back. There never has been. And there never will be. God is against the thing. It's really sense that in the last days, he said, come out from among them, my people. That you touch not their unclean things, and I'll receive you. Like the Uzziah, what did he try to do? He tried to take the place of an anointed office. God's anointed office, Uzziah, tried to assert that authority because he was a great man. 
We've seen these self-styled organizations crowd everything it is, God, and try to take the office of the church, the anointed church. And by creeds, we found that they're dead in unbelief. And they'll never rise again. They'll die in the leper camp with the rest of them. See there? Man thinking man, scripture believing man, see that. If you're born of God, you see it. God's so clearly identifying the thing to influence you. As we've preached all week and things, what is to do? Track the attention. It influences you to see where they went and what's happened. Every one of them. If they organize another one, it'll do the same thing, but there'll be no more of them. No, it's over now. It's too late now. Lose your hope by accepting creeds and man-made doctrines. They're scared to come and stand by it. Like Uzziah trying to usurp the place of an anointed office because he's a big fella. Big fella. And among God's people, there's no big fellas. We're all children of God. God gives one of us one thing to do and another thing to do. That don't make us any better than anybody else. This makes God require more at your hand is all. Now, the effects of such a vision. And we're closing. Start praying for the sick in a few minutes. Now, the effects of such a vision... What did the effects do to this prophet? I wonder about a preacher. I wonder about an evangelist or a pastor. Look what a vision of this done and what he seen, what had happened to self-styled Uzziah. And then though a great man that God had honored, the great thing, they seen it dead. What effects did it have on the prophet? Here's what it did. It caused him to confess himself to be a sinner for associating with such He confessed, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I've been dwelling among people with unclean lips. Making him a prophet, not a preacher, a prophet confessed that he was a sinful man because he had been associated with such. Then what? When he confessed his sins, then come the cleansing. Oh, you cannot be clean from your sin until you confess his sin. Do you recognize his sin? Then come the cleansing as soon as he said, Woe is me, for my eyes have seen the vindication of a great God. The angels, the burners, the sacrificers are here and the post is moving at their voice. And here they are in this vision flying back and forth. He saw something real, a vision had come down. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among unclean people. He said, he cried out for mercy. He called himself a sinner. Then what happened? One of the cherubims went over to the altar and took the tongs and picked up a live coal and put it on his hand. Not carried in the tong now. Picked up the coal, put it on his hand, and come and laid it up on the prophet's lips. And it said, thy iniquity, iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is something that you know it's wrong and still holding to it. When you know your creeds are wrong and you still hold to it, that's iniquity. But when he confessed that he was wrong, there was a cleansing power. He took a coal of fire. Did you notice how God, we see how God set his servants in order and what he fixed him with, how he could have been humble, reverent, and put himself in action. Watch, when he cleansed the servant, he never done it by a seminary. He never done it by a bunch of books. We find here that God cleans his servants by fire. A coal of fire touched the prophet. Cleaned his lips. God cleans his servants by his holy fire. Not by books. Not by education, theology. But he cleaned his servants by fire. Then as soon as he was confessed and cleansed, then followed the commission. First he had to confess. Then he had to be cleansed. And now it's a commission. It was then that the cleansed Isaiah cried when he heard the voice of God said, Who will go for us? Look at back in history when you're reading this when you go home. What had happened to Israel? She'd got the same place we are. They had called all their sacrifices and things had become a tradition to them. There was no sincerity. They didn't honor the word of God. That's when God raised up Isaiah to tell him them sacrifices stunk in his nose. He didn't want them. They were blasphemy to him. That he didn't want no more to do with them. And when this Isaiah was cleaned and ready to go preach the gospel then, 
And the voice of God said, now there's a need. These things has got to be told. And one voice said to the other, the angels flying, said, who will go for us? Then Isaiah, with a clean heart, cleansed, confessed, cleansed, and commissioned the vision. said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. Here am I. Send me. God send your holy angels again today. Find your Isaiah somewhere. My prayer, I, I'm, not, I'm just saying this because I know he's here. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as clean as clean could be. When the voice of God said, who will go for us? Then he answered, Master, here am I. Send me. He wasn't afraid then, but the word. He was a prophet. The word could come to him. He was always unbelief and traditions was gone. He could stand before that traditional age and tell them your sacrifices stinks in the nose of God. And the very God that you claim to serve will destroy you. That's what he said. Amen. The God that you claim you're serving will destroy you. And he did it. They said a sign. He said, I'll give you a super sign. A virgin shall conceive. Isaiah wrote 66 chapters in his book. And there's 66 books in the Bible. He starts off with the beginning of creation and ends up in the millennium just like the entire Bible does. That great prophet of God who is willing to confess that all the traditions is wrong. Get down there and get cleansed until the word of God could come to him. Then he said, I'm ready to go, Lord. I'm ready. I'll speak what you say, speak. I'll say what you say, say. He was ready to go. God Bring the angels again this afternoon, the Holy Ghost and fire, and cleanse my brother's hearts everywhere. May they be such influences that others will see and want to follow too. Let us bow our heads. Quietly. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who'll go for us? Then he answered, Master, here, send me. Quietly now, all together. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord, speak, and I will answer, Lord, send me. Millions now in sin and shame are dying. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their rescue. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord. Speak, and I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak, and I will answer, Lord, send me. Let's hum it quietly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go down to the temple now. Listen to their sad, bitter cry. Oh, brother, come with me, won't you? Hasten, brother, hasten to their rescue. They don't know what denomination belongs to or nothing. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. Isaiah, are you here? Can I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak, my Lord, speak, and I will answer.
Master, Lord, send me. I wonder with your heads bowed and your hearts bowed. Isaiah, where are you? Will you raise up your hand and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'm ready. God bless you. I don't really mean it. 90% of the audience. Speak, my Lord. Speak and I will answer. Lord, send me. Look, ministers, you raise your hand. Look at our women. Our sisters. What a disgrace. Look at our man. Think more of an organization than they do of the Word of God. Jesus Christ proved himself among them. It's exactly the scripture so plain and made known, and yet they'll hang right to it. Brother, someone say, Well, I wouldn't have nothing, I, they, I wouldn't have no place to go. Brother, if I had to eat soda crackers and drink branch water, I'd stay with my Lord. He's my life, He's my bread. You think I do this to be different? I do this because I love Him, because it's my commission. Stand side by side with Him with that word. Oh, speak and I will answer. Lord, send me. Heavenly Father, as the music is sweetly playing, may everyone that's in divine presence, Lord, see that it. This is the calling time. It's a, it's a separating time when the chaff and, and wheat is to be separated. Although the, the wheat has been wrapped in the chaff. But now it's a calling out time. It's another exodus. I pray God as the great sunlight has brightened the grain forever stage of its life from the time like in Canada now when the wheat's just coming up. That hot sun of July would kill it right now. But it has to ripen according to the way that nature brings the sun upon it. So does a hot sun upon Luther's doctrine, Wesley and the rest of them, it scorches it down. But it's to ripen the wheat. It should have matured, Lord, just as it come up. But remember, all the branches was pruned off. And the bride tree come right out of the center. I will restore again all the years of the palmer worm caterpillar. The same insect only in different stages has eaten away. I will restore it, saith the Lord. You'll do it, Lord. You promised it. I pray that you'll do it in every heart this afternoon. They're yours, Lord. I commit them to you. Now, I, I may never see them. If I come back a year of the day, there's many sitting here. If I'm living, they won't be. No doubt. The size crowd. Next time I meet him, we'll be at the judgment. Let him see, Lord. Let him open their eyes if there's to see. All these on tape, Lord, it's listen to the voice at this time. Many different languages even be translated. May they understand. May men and women in little houses and out in little jungles in Africa with those little machines with the tubes in their ears. May they hear, Lord, hear. Granted, the missionary was right in what he said, but this is... A greater witness than what he had is ready now. Hear us, Father. We commit it all to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son, and for the calling of his bride. Amen. Now, my brother, sister, we're going to pray for the sick. Each one of you that raise your hand. I, I can't give it. If I could give it to you, I'd do it. Certainly. I come right down there and say, here, you want it? I, I have it. I, it isn't mine to give. It's God. And God will give it to you if there's a hunger in your heart. Before there can be a calling to the deep, there's got to be a deep to respond to that call. Before there can be a creation, there has to be a creator to create that creation. You know there's something there you're reaching for. There's got to be something out there to respond to that call. Won't you receive it now? Don't let it die. Please don't. If I never see any more this side of the judgment, may I see you there. Washed and ready, my prayer. Now the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
who appeared on the earth in the form of a man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, buried, rose the third day and ascended into heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the majesty, sending back the spirit that was upon him called the Holy Spirit, God, upon to come upon mankind, the fellowship, to carry on the ministry that was carried on in that glorious body of Christ. Supposing it to come as a pyramid is shaped up like that, the headstone never was put on it. Why? It was rejected. Now, way down, the church has constantly come to minority. It's come on up now to all the church ages has run out. It's got to be honed. That stone has to fit straight in. The ministry that was in Jesus Christ has to be in his church to make Christ come for the church, to raise up every age, to bring it, to bring it out. It's like the wheat. The wheat has to come plumb back as it starts maturing from the grain where it rotted, died, and come forth and kept coming up from grass into something else. You can't go back to grass. Don't pour it back to grass. Don't pour it back to this. Don't pour it back to the sheath. Come on till you get to the wheat. And the wheat has to be the same kind of a wheat that went into the ground when it's matured. Jesus is raised from the dead. He's matured now. And he's matured in his church through justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost, through these reformers in the early days. Now here he is on earth today in his people, believing he's here. Just that you might see they might be strangers. May the God of heaven honor what I've said about him. Now I want you in the audience, please don't nobody go out no more. Just give the God of heaven this much respect just to set a moment. Now don't move. Let every person in here that's sick or needy raise up your hand. For you. All right. Thank you. I don't know. I know Brother King sitting right here. I just recognized him just a few minutes ago. I'm sure, I think that's who that is. It's Brother King sitting there. He sponsored my last meeting here. Brother King, I can't say what I want to say. But you know I know what I want to say. You've been through the mill, my little brother. God be merciful to you. <laughs> Others, I don't know. I still see Pat Tyler sitting here. I think that's the only man in the building or only woman. Anything that I know, anything is this man, Pat Tyler, sitting here. Believe now. And if I be the servant of God, and if God be here and I've identified his word to be the truth, then let the God of heaven who raised up his son, Jesus Christ, who made these promises, identify it with you that I've told the truth. How would he do it? Not becoming with a robe on and beard, but his life. I am the vine, ye are the branches. The life that's in the vine is in the branch. The works that I do shall you also and promise it. And this day when the next branch comes forth. We've got a lot of grafted branches, sure. It'll bear fruit, but not this kind of fruit. Oh, no. I seen a tree in Phoenix not long ago. It had about eight or nine different fruits on it. Brother John shared on it. I said, what kind of a tree is that? He said, it is a orange tree, Brother Branham. Well, I said, there's lemons and grapefruit and, and a tangerine, aloes and tangerines in it. He said, yes, it's all citrus fruits that I grafted them in there. Oh, I said, I see. Now, next year, they'll all be oranges. He said, oh, no. Mm -mm. No. Next year, the, the lemon will be a lemon. The, the grapefruit will be a grapefruit. I said, off of that same vine? Off of that same, off of, off of an orange tree? He said, yes. They're all citrus fruit, Brother Bram. It'll live by the citrus fruit. Then I felt the tears running down my cheeks. I said, Lord Jesus, I know what you mean now. There it is. These denominations just grab to themselves in, but they're bearing denominational fruit. Listen. If that real branch ever brings forth, a real vine brings forth another branch, it'll be of the original. Yes. Believe it. Thank the Lord. 
I, he's promised it. I have everybody real reverend. I'm going to just stand here and ask the Lord Jesus. This is a gift. What is a gift? If I can move my own thinking. If I can move my own life from my, my natural life, my soul. That's William Brand. If I can get him out of the way, God will use the, spirit, the body to speak. Let the Holy Spirit come now, Lord. That they might see by human beings that the identified Holy Spirit is here. A gift to get yourself the way. Everybody real reverence. Sit still. Just a man sitting out here. I, I want you all to raise your heads and look just a minute. Can you see that right here on this man? A light, amber light, burning, circling. This, how many seen the picture of it? It's taken here at Houston. You see, it's in the Washington D.C. all over the world. Only supernatural being was ever photographed in all the world. Here it is, right here now. I take every spirit in here under my control. In the name of Jesus Christ. This man's suffering from a gland trouble in his throat. I don't know him, never seen him in my life, but that's the truth. Isn't that right, sir? You believe now, the man in the back there, you believe that God will make known to me about you? You're Mr. Hall. That's your name, isn't it? <clears throat> All right, sir. It's over now. Your faith makes you well. I could call a prayer line. Get him up here on the platform. There's no need of it. Let's take one of these rows here somewhere. Here, start right here. Here's a little girl sitting here. Look this way, honey. <clears throat> Might not have nothing wrong with you. I don't know. But just say instead of a prayer line coming up here, let's get it down here. Look here, sweetheart. Look at Brother Branham. In the days when Jesus was here on earth, yes, she is sick. She's seriously sick, that child. Man. Yes, sir. If Jesus was here, he could tell you what was wrong with you, wouldn't he? You believe in Jesus sent Brother Brandon to do it? If I'll tell you what's wrong with you, you believe it, he'll heal you? It's sugar diabetes for that little child. No way in the world for it to be healed outside of God. You believe, honey? Now, the lady sitting next to it raised her hand up. That's the mother to the child. That is right. Lay your hand over on her, sister. Believe now. God brought that child to you. May the Lord grant her healing. This next lady sitting next to the mother there. Look here at me, lady. You believe me to be his servant? God's servant? If God will tell me something in your life, or what you're wanting, if you're sick or you're not sick or whatever it is, if God will tell me your desires, will you believe, or something like that, I don't know what he would do. Would you believe it? You know, it would have to be Jesus Christ. You're way away from me. You couldn't touch me if you had to. Because if you touch me, it had to be physical. You have to touch spirit. The Spirit is Christ. He's a high priest now, the Bible says, that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. You are suffering also. You believe that God can tell me what your trouble is? You're suffering with a back trouble and high blood, and you, um, you have high blood pressure and you have heart trouble. That's exactly right. If that's right, raise up your hand. That's right. You believe now? What about you with your arm around her there? The lady this way. Look here. Do you, I'm a stranger to you. Do you believe me to be his servant? You believe me that what I've said the truth, that I have told you the truth. You believe that God can reveal to me your trouble or whatever, you, whatever it is. You believe he can reveal it. It really isn't anything that you're wanting prayed for. You have a prayer card I see in your hand. You're the first one with a prayer card. You believe God can tell me what you got the prayer card for? It's for your husband. <laughs> you believe that God can tell me what's wrong with your husband? If God doesn't touch him, he's going to die. He's got cancer. He's got lung trouble. That's right, isn't it? Uh, raise up your hand if that's so. If you believe, the rest of them will believe he can be healed. That man sitting next to you, do you believe me to be a servant, sir? If God can reveal to me what your trouble is, will you believe them with all your heart? You're suffering with a heart trouble. That's right, if that's right, raise up your hand. Hmm? Alright? The lady just shook her head and herself like that sitting next to you. Do you believe that God can tell me what's your heart or something you desire in your heart or something or something you're praying for somebody else? You believe God could reveal it to me while the, the anointing is here and we can see it and see it's got to be something real. It's revealing the secrets of the heart. Tell them what it's like Jesus told the woman at the well. Now you're also suffering. You, uh, you suffer with a back trouble. Yours is in your back. Raise up your hand if that's so. Mm -hmm. 
Now the lady next to her that's weeping with your purse laying in your pocket with a blue dress on dark hair, heavy set. Look to me, do you believe me to be God's servant? Look here, see you're on the front row. I can contact you easy by the help of God. You believe that God can tell me what your trouble is? It's like he's in the prayer line. Do you believe that that could be so from here? You do? You have a high blood pressure that you're suffering with. That's right, raise up your hand. All right? You believe and you can be healed. Lady next to her, what do you think, sister? Look this way to me. You believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? You do that with all your heart? You believe God can describe to me like the woman at the well when Jesus and the woman come together? They could tell me what your trouble is? You believe? Would it help you? Would it help you to believe? Look. Or you have a serious thing. It's a son, a boy. Mm -hmm. And that boy has got a mental nervousness. He's at home. That's right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Believe with all your heart. The boy will get well. You believe? Next lady to there. Do you believe, sister, with all your heart? You believe me to be his prophet, his servant? You believe it's Jesus Christ just by a gift? A prophecy is a gift. You know, a gift of God is ordained way back before the world started. It had to be ordained for this day. You have no way of going, what's what? God just identifies it and interprets his word. Do you believe that to be so what you heard? You believe, I could, if I could tell you what was wrong, you know, it wouldn't be me. It had to be another, just my voice, but somebody else using it. Just like this microphone. It's a mute till something speaks to it. We're strangers. See, I lost Connor. Here she is. Yes, sir. The lady is suffering with a Nema condition. It's in her blood. That's right. Raise up your hand, lady. That's right. You, you're also praying for this little fellow on the end. That's your little uh, son sitting there on the end. That's right. Wave your hand. If God can tell me what's wrong with your little son, will you believe with all your heart that God speaks to me? And that's right. He's suffering with an extreme nervous condition. That is right. Isn't that right? Then lay your hand over on him and believe with all your heart. And you'll get well. I challenge you to believe it. Thus saith the Lord God. Texas, if you die in sin, you die without my blood on you. Remember, your blood's not on me. There's the truth. That's Jesus Christ identified. Prayer lines, wherever it is. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you do it? Are you convinced? Are you fairly convinced that it has to be Jesus Christ according to the word of promise this day? Raise up your hands, everybody. Sturdy convinced that it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. I know you've been taught. You've been taught each one of you something. I see it's so annoying you just sway it everywhere now. I see. You've been taught that you must lay hands on the sick. That's a tradition. It's all right. Jesus endorsed it. But that Roman, that's what I've been trying to get you this week. I'm not worthy, said the Roman, you come under my roof. Just say the word. See? If somebody lays hands on you, then, brother so-and-so laid hands on me, glory to God. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask ministers, believing ministers, to come here. So it just it ain't my hands. It's, it's, it's just what Jesus said. They shall lay hands on the sick. We're going to pray for the sick. Everyone, how many's got prayer cards out through the building? Let's see your hands. Yeah, we promise you. Now we've got a half hour to make that right. I'm going to ask, how would we ruin this? Brother Perry, have you got any suggestions? From this side over here, let this row here on the outside that's got prayer cards stand up against the wall. Go out that way and stand up against the wall. All right, sir. That's fine. Stand over on that side. All from this middle here. From now, you stand in the aisle. See, you just stand in the aisle. Ones in this aisle, this middle here. Stand out in the aisle. Ones on that side. Stand on that side. The ones in here stand up here in the middle on this side, and the ones on that side stand in there. And just follow your lines through as they come. That's right. They'll be down there instructing you on what to do. I'm asking. This is all right, brother Perry. I'm asking for ministers who believe in Christ, that Christ will heal these sick people by laying on hands and following his commandments. I'm asking you to come here and stand with me. If you believe this to be the truth, any gospel minister, if you're a Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic priest, whatever you are, if you believe that Jesus Christ heals the sick and has commissioned his disciples to lay hands on the sick for their healing, will you come here? Tell everybody. But everybody that wants to be prayed for, go to the back. Now go to the back and follow around. See, all in these lines. Now go right back and take your place. Follow right around that way. And then you go right back to your place again, just as orderly as it can be. I wonder, brethren, if we had better get down there. I think that's a good idea. Now, you better leave this microphone here. Let Roy, you stand here with the microphone. Or, yes, you better come down with me. See, you see. Or unless you want to stand here. All right, Roy, you stand here then. All right. Now you're going. Now I won't. Don't nobody leave, please. See the very thing that we've been praying for. Now you say, Brother Branham, why'd you bring all these ministers up here? I'm gonna come right with them. But I see what it is. 
they have as much right to pray for the sick as I do or anybody does. As much as Oral Roberts or, or any hierarchy, no matter who he is. They have as much right to pray for the sick as Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, any of the rest of them have. They're ministers called of God. I have to see two or three brothers in there that I know personally that has a ministry of praying for the sick. Now, as you're lining yourselves up over here, I want how many in this congregation is thoroughly convinced with all your heart that you believe it's God's will to heal them people. Sure it is. Certainly it's God's will to heal them. Now, how do they get healed? Now, if he was sure himself, he could do no more than what he's done right now. Do you believe that? Just what he's done now, that's what he would do because he's the same yesterday, day, and forever. How many knows that St. John 5, 19 says this, the son can do nothing in himself. How many knows that? But what he sees the father doing, that doeth the son. Believe that? Then Jesus never performed one miracle until the Father showed him by vision what to do. That's his own word. If that isn't so, then we're all lost. We don't know where we're at. There you are. See, his words are infallible. Look at him going through the pool of Bethesda a few hours, about an hour before that. There lay great multitudes of lame, blind, halt, withered. How many knows that's true? And he never touched the one of them. Yet he was a God of compassion. Do you believe he had compassion? Lee and that mother with a waterhead baby. That poor old blind daddy called him. Somebody put him in the water when it's trouble. God of compassion. See, people don't know what compassion is. They mix a filial love with a gospel love. It's two different loves altogether. Compassion is the same thing. Desires and compassion is different. But look, he went to a man that had maybe a prostrate trouble. Or maybe it was uh, tuberculosis. It was retarded. He'd had it for... It, it was... Uh, it was 38 years he'd had it. It wasn't going to kill him. And he went to that man and he said, Will thou be made whole? How many knows that's true? And left the rest of the audience lay there. What if he'd done that in Beaumont today? Oh my. There's nothing to divine healing then, you see. See, they don't understand Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I do nothing till the Father shows me first. But many people just laid in the shadow of him and was healed by their own faith. A little woman touched his garment and was made whole. How many knows that? Healing is based upon your faith. God's identification is based upon the promise of his word. But your faith in his identification is what heals you. If you don't... No matter the holiest man in all the world could stand here and pray all day long, it wouldn't do one bit of good until you believe it emphatically yourself. Jesus might be standing here himself in the incarnate body, lay hands upon you, it's still you would not get healed. How many knows that? Many mighty works he could not do because of their unbelief. That's scripture. So you see you in the prayer line? It's got to be your faith in the Word. Now, if you see God doing what He's done, look, let me just give one little testimony while you're getting ready. Listen close. Night before last, there's a little minister here somewhere. I've seen him here a while ago. Martin was his name. I forget. He's one of the sponsors right here. About midnight, close to it, someone woke me up in my room. A little fellow crying, a little minister. His baby had just passed away. The tears running down his face. He's plumb up in somewhere in, what's the name of that town they live in? Missouri. Missouri. Up at where? Wardell. Wardell, Missouri. I know the boy. I know his brother here too. They're friends of mine. This brother walked in there with tears running down his cheeks. said, Brother Branham, I just called, my wife just called me, my little baby just quit breathing. He laid his hands upon me and said, Brother Branham, I believe the word of the Lord is with you. Oh, how could God? It's like, even now, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. See, he wasn't confessing to me. He's confessing the word of the Lord. You see, that I was preaching the truth. He said, I believe the word of the Lord is with you. Just ask him, my baby will live. In 10 minutes from then, his baby was breathing normal as well now. My son, standing here somewhere, Billy Paul, uh, he went out to talk to him. I was there in my pajamas about... A few minutes later, he come back and said, Daddy, Daddy, look at here. And his throat all swelled out in red and a great big whelp, whelp about that big around. He said, a big black looking spider with a red spot on it. I stand there, I was talking to John and he bit me there and look there, it's swelling out. I said, oh, Billy, a black widow made me. 
I said, look at your throat, how it swell. I put my hand and I said, Lord Jesus. And ten minutes from then, there wasn't even, you couldn't even tell the spot had ever been here. What is it? Someone came in the other day and said to the office, one of the officers come out and said, tell Brother Bram just to say that my child, he said, I believe if what you'd say, but see, I can't say it that he tells me. But here I've got the word. It says this. These signs shall follow them and believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now, God can't do those things and leave you. Stand there. You've got to, you believe the same thing. It'll happen to you. But you've got to believe it. Not just bluff it. You've got to believe it. Now, let us pray first all together. I want each one of you all, while the brethren stand here at this microphone, I'm going down there so I can lay hands on them too. They're my people. They're my, they're the stars in my crown. This time they are in your crown, my minister brothers. I'm coming there because we love them and they're God's children. We're coming to help them. Now let us pray. Lord Jesus, the man that could say that your presence isn't here, would there would be something mentally wrong. Just like a man who would refuse to accept the sunlight. Somebody telling the sun shining, he'd run down in the basement and shut the door and say, I just refuse to believe it. I refuse to believe it. Well, we know, Lord, that something mentally was wrong with the man. And so does a man that would shut up his bowels of compassion. And the light of the word of Jesus Christ being made manifest would say, I don't believe it. There's something spiritually wrong with the man. So we know that you're here, Father. Without a doubt, we believe it. We see your, your footprints. We see your marks. We see your word. There's hundreds standing here in this prayer line. And fine man of God standing here, great warriors of the faith. I'm walking down to put my shoulder with theirs, Lord. When these sick people pass through this prayer line, may each one of them know that it's just not passing through by some man. They're coming under the cross of the promise. May they go away from here healed, go away rejoicing, get well, tell their pastor. May that cause an old-fashioned revival to break out down around in these countries, Lord. Bring many souls to you. Lord, they're yours. Help them. Heal them, I pray, in Jesus Christ's name. I want everyone now, with your heads bowed, praying. And I want you listen to the prayer line now. When you pass through, just like you was under the cross, believe with everything that's in you. Go away from here rejoicing, happy, saying, thank you, Lord. I believe my healing. And if you don't believe that, it would be just as well to take your seat because it won't do one bit of good. And I want all the congregation, everybody, to just storm up to heaven like that in the presence of Christ. Lord Jesus, make yourself known to us now. Heal these sick. Will you do it? Brother Borders, while you sing, only believe. No, no, leave that here. Only believe. Now. Let's all sing together now as we pray for these that are coming through the line. Only believe, everyone now believe, only believe. Let's raise our hands now. All things are possible. Only believe. Now let's say it like this. Now I again I want to leave Texas seeing them shout the praises of God let's just raise up our hands and give God praise every one of us Lord Jesus we thank you for your word what you've done for us I thank you for being able to speak to these fine people and to see your power and blessings upon them bless them Lord may they understand and may the Holy Ghost heal everyone and save everyone in this last days to Jesus Christ's name Lord I present them to you for material for the bride for they are